how do you describe it? Well, we're working to make housing better by creating community-driven spaces um, and you know, bringing people together. So working with a number of groups from uh, you know, tech boot camps to um, membership organizations, affinity groups to provide housing for their audiences. So we have a great group of uh, individuals living in, uh, living in Brooklyn, New York right now, and we're looking to you know, build a global residential company. We're gonna get deep into the, the common story, but first I wanna start even, even way back. You know, before Common, you, you founded General Assembly with, uh, with your buddies, and before that, you know, you're doing a bunch of experiments in, in Yale. Did you know uh, in college? <laughs> uh, you know, I had no idea what I wanted to do in college. I just kind of fell into it and fell in love with it. So when I was in, in college, I started selling antique furniture online, um, buying it off of primarily colleges and universities, refurbishing it. And then uh, and then selling it on eBay, and uh, you know we had our own e-commerce site, and it was uh, it was fun. Yeah. Did you like furniture, or were you just? <laughs> well, I I, I love I loved history. I'm, I, I've always been a big fan of history, and there were these awesome pieces of history that were really coming out of you know interesting universities that were just throwing it all away or you know getting rid of it somehow. And so we uh, built some relationships and started getting this furniture, and we we're like, wow, what do we do with it? So, uh, you know, started, uh, started listing it online and that was my first, uh, first experience as an entrepreneur. And it was, uh, you know, skipping college to rent a U-Haul and go pick up furniture from some random university. It was a lot of fun. Did, did you take a semester off? Did, never took a semester off. No, actually just went straight through, uh, skipped a lot of class though. Yeah, absolutely. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> the way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. So when you, and did you work with any of your general assembly? Yeah, actually, Matt Brimer and I um, is uh, one of my co-founders at General Assembly and also uh, worked with me. He was my co-founder of that. I, I mean, if you can even call us co-founders, uh, given that we were mostly just buying and selling furniture. Uh, yeah, we worked, with, we, we worked on that together. and It was a ton of fun. So t let's start from the beginning. How did the General Assembly story come? Yeah, uh, totally. So, you know, we, we initially started General Assembly kind of as this community hub. This was kind of before co-working was, was really an established thing. And certainly before we worked, turned it into a, a business. Um, we want to create this community hub for entrepreneurs, designers, hackers, et cetera. And uh, so we built out this beautiful space um, back in 2010 um, in New York City. And we just started getting a lot of people coming by. Um, hanging out, we would have people teach classes and open them to the community. And pretty quickly, we started noticing that there was more of a demand for these classes than there were was for the space. And you know, the space we, we sold out and that, that was it. And there was really nowhere we wanted to go from there because we didn't exactly want to build another space. So we just kept doing more classes, more classes, more classes. And that kind of got us on this, this, this idea that there's a big gap between what's taught in universities and the skills people need to succeed in the workforce. So everything from, you know, keep in mind this was in 2010, you know, digital marketing, UX design, web development, product management, data science, these were all things that companies really needed, both startups and kind of large Fortune 500s. They needed these skill sets and there was really no one training people in these disciplines. So we took time to actually start building longer courses, like three-month immersives, full-time programs, part-time programs that gave people some of these skills and were tied into job opportunities in these companies. And that, you know, that took off and, uh, you know, we, uh, we found ourselves out of the space business and into the education business pretty quickly. And when did you think, uh, at what point did you make the pivot from, from the co-working space to, to the education. That, that was a huge pivot, but you know, change of focus. It was so gradual. I mean, it just, it just kind of happened. It's like one day we were running a co-working space that offered classes, and the next moment we were running a school that offered co-working. So it just, there was never a moment where we all kind of, at least I don't remember it, where we all kind of sat down and were like, you know what? We're gonna build an education company. No, it just, you know, we looked up one day and, and, and we had an education company. Right. right. And you, and you know, I know you and Brian are well, you have such different skill sets. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. It really is. I, you know, 
I, I have so much respect for both the role he played at building General Assembly. He's one of my best friends. Um, and also now on to Daybreaker um, and what he's doing there, which, uh, which, which just seems like such a crazy idea in the abstract. But if there's anyone he can, who can uh, pull off bringing an early morning dance party to a dozen cities or whatever they're in now, um, it's Matt Reimer. Yeah, I love Daybreaker. How would you describe uh, your core comp? Um, you know, it's really kind of the intersection of product and marketing is kind of where I've where I've always focused. So, you know, I built the education business at General Assembly and then ran product there for a few years. So, you know, really coming up with new markets and kind of the intersection of, uh, you know, where's their demand, where's their interest, and you know, where can we build something that that really is compelling and meets a user need. Um, you know, I've I, I've always been as a hobby building games. I've been building games since I was in the seventh grade, um, but I never really looked at that as a, a, a as a potential uh, potential job. So I've I've come from a little bit of a te you know some tech in my background, but I've never looked at that really as kind of my my core competency. Were you are you a huge gamer still? Uh, I, to the extent I have time for it, yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. And how would you describe Brimer's? Oh my God, uh, making magical things happen. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, I, I guess I was, I was always like much more of like, you know, the, the operator, you know, reasonable one. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, he was the one that would come up with, with crazy ideas and get them done. And, uh, you know, it, it, that's how, you know, big, big chunk of this got built. And, you know, Jake as well, who was, uh, it was CEO of General Assembly to this day, um, brings a lot of experience to the table too. So we had a great, you know, great group of folks in the early days of General Assembly. And when you kind of advise other entrepreneurs, uh, how do you advise them to kind of build out their, their co-founder teams? Like what, what skill sets are absolutely necessary or? You know, I, I, I go back to the, you know, idea that you need, you know, you need someone who can sell and someone who can build. And, you know, sometimes that comes in one package and sometimes it doesn't. But, you know, in an early stage company, generally you're either selling or you're building. And both those are skill sets in and of themselves. And they require as much, you know, knowing how to sell. Um, and by sell, I don't necessarily mean like sell a product for money. I mean, you know, come up with a compelling vision, come up with a value proposition, understand how to marry a product and a market. Um, that's a skill set that is honed over time just as much as, uh, you know, software development is. No, definitely. And as you, you know, you spent, you know, almost five years at General Assembly. How did you, you know, think about what you might want to do next? And, you know, you could have spent, you know, your whole life building, you know, General Assembly. It's going to be, an, it already is an iconic company. Yeah. Well, one, I kind of got... Uh, enamored with this th this need, this customer need that you know there was you know there's a massive housing shortage in major cities. You know, people in particular, young people in particular, many of General Assembly students were moving to major cities and would struggle to find places to live. And that kind of cued me into this concept of you know. Rental real estate is a rough user experience between dealing with brokers, dealing with landlords and their giant reams of paper, you know, showing up to a tour and bringing a cashier's check and having to close that day. There's just a lot of rough parts of the user experience and looked at this and said, you know, is there a way both kind of from a financial standpoint as well as from a, you know, user-centered design standpoint that you can build a better experience? So improve on the real estate, improve on the UX, improve on you know, the kind of brand and the design. And, you know, frankly, you've got a lot of young people, uh, you know, living in major cities with roommates. It's something that happens all the time, but there's no real estate. There's no, there's no housing that's designed for the needs of roommates. You have people effectively living in units and in houses that are designed for families because that's, how we've been building housing for a long time, designed for families, um, with you know four or five, six roommates, and we looked at this and said, you know, there's there's an opportunity to build something that's you know kind of more designed, both from a 
kind of sticks and bricks real estate perspective, as well as, you know, from a product perspective, more, more designed for the needs of roommates. And what have been the traditional barriers preventing others from doing this in the past? Yeah, well, it's, you know, one is it's, it's incredibly tricky to actually get inventory. Um, that's the real bottleneck here is how do you get whole buildings, um, you know, because I really think whole buildings work the best for this. If you can take a vacant building and, you know, kind of build a community within it, um, you know, as opposed to taking single rooms or single units off the market. Um, so we, you know, we, we really built uh, this competency around real estate and, and finance and how do you structure these deals in a way that kind of incentivizes everyone to do the right thing, do the best possible thing for the user. So, you know, we're kind of set up a little bit like a management company. Um, you know, the best way to think about what Common is, is it's like, uh, you know, Starwood for residential buildings. Um, and we thought that, you know, in hospitality, you have a lot of great brands that have built incredible user experiences. You don't have that in residential real estate. So uh, we're looking to kind of take a model that's been perfected in the hotel space and take it into an area where you have kind of longer term, longer term tenants, longer term residents. Do you think about, are, are you guys competitors to the hospitality industry at all? Like, do you get into? No, we're, we're really not. You know, we don't look at ourselves as a competitor to like a hotel or an Airbnb at all because, you know, we're not serving tourists. These are not people who are here, temp you know, or in New York temporarily. Our minimum stay is 30 days. So, you know, we really look at ourselves more as, and, and our, our target audience really are people who are staying here a lot longer. You know, we want to build a community. We want to cultivate a group of people that are here for a long time and not just transients coming in and out. So we don't really look at ourselves as competitive with any kind of traditional hotel. How do you compete with, with WeWork when, you know, they think about their We Live thing and they already have, you know, so much real estate already. Uh, well, a bunch of ways. One is, you know, it's a super fragmented market. You're talking about, res, you know, multifamily residential real estate. You know, new buildings open up all the time. Um, so there's no dominant player. There's not even any player that owns more than like 0.1% of the market um, in residential real estate. So it's not like thinking about a SaaS application or something like that where, or a social network where it's a winner take all. Um, it's, you know, we're thinking about it much more in terms of how do we deliver a great user experience? You know, there's such a housing shortage in these cities. Um, you know, I think, uh, we will all be lucky as a society and a culture if there's so much competition bringing so much new housing onto the market that it actually meaningfully lowers rents. Like, yeah, it may not be good for us as a business, but think about how transformative that would actually be to society if so many competitors with new housing models came onto the market that you actually lowered the cost of renting an apartment. Like that would be completely revolutionary and transformative. Um, so, you know, I look at it as a win-win. What have you learned about starting a company and building your early team, uh, you know, from General Assembly that you've taken, you know, almost five years later yeah, totally. So I, I, I try to, you know, it's one of the things I think we did tremendously well at General Assembly that, you know, we're replicating here at Common. We have, you know, we have a small team. We have 13 people now. We have a mix of people on the real estate side and the finance side, you know, community, product and engineering and design. Um, and, you know, we really look at this at an early stage as, you know, you hire for people, not for roles. Um, and you hire for skill sets as well, not for roles. So, you know, when you're a 200 person company, I mean, General Assembly by the time I left was you know, 600 odd employees, you know, you really hire for roles. You kind of have to hire for roles. You write a job description. This is exactly what we want. This is what the job is responsible for. This is what it fits into. Um, with an early stage company like Common, I would say kind of anything pre 25 people, it's really hard to hire for specific roles and you kind of end up hiring for hats. And you can end up with one person, you almost have to end up with one person that wears multiple hats. And you can kind of think about it dynamically and say, hey, we have four hats that need to be worn. We want someone who's probably going to wear two or three of those hats. And think about like what kind of combinations of hats you can put together. 
So when we put job descriptions up, um, which we do, you know, we almost think about them less as like, oh, here is a very specific, narrowly defined role we're hiring for, and more just like honeypots of like, hey, let's put this out here, let's get applications, let's get smart people in the door that we can start having conversations with, and then, you know, we can figure out what hats would be best for them to wear, um, and you know, what hats would be best for them to wear today, and then what hats would be best for them to wear when we're a 50, 60, 70 person company. That is, how are they go going to grow with the organization? And you guys raised uh, a bunch of money. I'm not sure if you, if you can talk about it. But yeah, totally. I, yeah, we, we, raised, uh, we raised seven and a half million dollars basically from a, from a PowerPoint, um, you know, led by Maveron, um, which is a great firm started by Dan Levitan and, uh, and Howard Schultz of Starbucks fame. Um, it's a great group of people. They and, and they're the lead investors in General Assembly as well. So I've built a relationship with them over five years. So they're the kind of people I want on my board. You know, we have Jason Stofer, who's a partner at Maveron, on our board. Um, and it was so easy. I didn't shop it at all. It was really like I was leaving General Assembly, had been talking back and forth with the Maveron folks about what I might want to do next. And, you know, kind of as soon as I honed in on this and said, hey, I'd, I'd like to take a, you know, like to try building a better user experience here and, and building a business in this space. Um, they said, hey, why don't we do it together? So, um, you know, raised, uh, raised seven and a half million pretty much uh, on day one. And you had a, you know, you have other kind of strategics involved uh, and you had a lot of people who wanted to get in into yeah. the round. How do you think about evaluating, uh, you know, which, which investors are gonna be most helpful to you and in what context, you know, where yeah, so it's you know we were we were in the fortunate place so that we had a lot more interest in the round than uh, you know than 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 we had space. Um, you know, Maveron did about seventy percent of the round, and we had about two million left over um, to you know allocate to interesting strategics, angels. You know, one thing I certainly wanted to do is you know uh, make sure people who have been helpful to me in the past were able to get in. So that was kind of first priority. Um, and then find some really interesting strategics in the real estate space. So, you know, my background's not in real estate. Uh, my background's in, you know, as I said, kind of technology and product. So getting people who really understood real estate and understood how real estate deals got done, how capital was raised in real estate, were really important, really, really important to get into the round. Um, because after all, it's like, you know, we not only had to raise money for the, for the operating company, the venture back company, but you know we we buy you know we basically buy buildings, so we have to raise a separate pool of real estate capital, you know, so we can actually control the real estate assets and uh, and you know have the kind of control that we want over over the properties. And it's interesting. I mean, real estate is interesting because a lot of people I don't you know say that, and maybe they're right. Maybe I have no idea that WeWork is is very overvalued because WeWork is you know at ten billion or whatever. Because it's valuing itself as a as a tech company instead of a real estate company, but they see it as a real estate company. You know, what is kind of the intersection of a real estate company and a tech company in the context of of WeWork and and in the context of? of yeah, totally. So I, I you know I, I don't I can't speak for WeWork or speak to their valuation because you know I'm, I'm you know neither WeWork nor am, I, nor am I an investor. But you know I think the the value proposition is that how people work is changing, how people live is changing. Um, there will be companies, large companies, maybe not $18 billion companies, but very large companies created around the future of work and living. And, you know, WeWork is, you know, I think very smartly positioning itself as one of the companies that, you know, will really be providing these kind of new work and living uh, relationships and these new kind of, um, you know, both on the, you know, co-working side as well as, you know, now the, the co-living side. And I think people look at us in, you know, focused on living and focused on the challenges of living and not kind of split between work and residential. Um, people kind of look at us as taking advantage of, you know, those kind of secular macro changes as well. And how do uh, you, who spent, you know, your time post-college in, in a tech company, how do you educate yourself real quick? And I know you've always had an interest in real estate and, you know, experience with, with General Assembly, but how do you become an expert on real estate? <laughs> oh my God, uh, that is a tough one. Real estate is so different. Like the way real estate people think about business is so different than the way someone from a venture-backed operating company thinks about business. And 
just how do you think about creating value? How do you think about, uh, and, and, and once you understand that, and frankly, the only way I understood it is to dive in and frankly, surround myself with some great people who have been doing it their entire lives, and then try to, uh, you know, make, uh, you know, bring the models together and kind of understand how they can uh, mesh in some really interesting ways. So you start realizing why it is the way it is. Why do landlords act the way they act? Why do property management companies act the way they act? And, you know, one of the biggest understandings that, that, that I never had before that I do now um, that, you know, if any real estate people are listening in are like, well, duh, um, is so much of it is dependent on the time horizon of your investors. And if you are, everyone thinks about real estate as being a very long-term game because we're familiar with like multi-generational property ownership, like, oh, I'm going to buy this building and in 30 years the mortgage will be paid off and my kids will inherit it. You know, that actually is a relative, relatively small percentage of how deals get done. Um, the vast majority of deals are done by property developers that think in very, very short-term increments, even shorter than you see with technology venture-backed businesses. They're thinking in terms of 18 to 36 months, you know, get a construction loan, buy a plot of land, build something, fill it up, refinance, that is get takeout financing that cashes out their construction loan and their equity, they own the building for free, and then they just move on to the next one. So it's a very, very, and once they move on to the next one, you know, they're not really any more involved than a founder after they've sold their company and left the acquirer. So it's why you don't really see many buildings that have incredibly active community management, programming, you know, the kind of community that you would expect to see from like a general assembly. Um, you don't really see that in, uh, in, in, in most, you know, kind of residential or commercial properties. And it really goes back to how are these companies structured? Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I know nothing about real estate. So this is, you know, talking to you. <laughs> Sorry if I get too deep in the weeds. Just, just call me out. Please do. Yeah. This is how we learn. Uh, did the real estate world embrace, you know, or investors, did they embrace common right away? They say, oh, this is obvious. This is totally going to happen. Or is it, no. <laughs> what is the response? You know, it is, it runs as far across the spectrum as you can imagine. I mean, you know, we had some people who fell in love with us from day one. And fortunately, the, the great thing about this is you don't need everyone to fall in love with you. You just need a few people um, to get the kind of inventory you need to really start proving out the experience and the product. So, yeah, fortunately, we had some great people who fell in love with us from day one. But, yeah, I mean, we were sitting in plenty of meetings where people, like, just kind of stared at us. And, uh, you know, interestingly enough, they'll usually treat you better. You know, you hear all these terrible things about VCs being like, or, uh, you know, real estate folks being, like, sharp-elbowed and, you know, slimy. You know, frankly, like, most real estate investors, you know, I remember them treating us better here than, you know, I was treated when I was a entrepreneur with no background trying to pitch VCs. And, you know, I, I can't remember a single real estate investor who was on their, uh, on their phone the whole time or fell asleep in the meeting and <laughs> definitely had, definitely had some VCs do that. Uh, you know, fell asleep in the meeting. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I feel like I can count three separate times, you know, when I was, you know, back six years ago, raising money, you know, for, for some idea, like VCs would literally fall asleep in the room. And, uh, you know, I, maybe I'm just not exciting enough, but it's, uh, you know, did not have that happen with any real estate investors, fortunately. Well, it's just, you know, let's uh, hypothetically, let's just say I am a very successful venture capitalist and or a founder with a big successful exit. Uh, and hopefully not too hypothetically in the future. But, and, <laughs> uh, you know, let's say I want to get into real estate and I, I have success in tech. Is real estate, you know, advise me, is real estate like tech a very relationships driven business? And would my relationship slash experience as a successful VC and or founder translate? Uh, depends and no, respectively. Uh, so it really, I mean, real, real estate can be an exceptionally relationships driven business if that's the strategy you're playing. Like if you're trying to get like interesting off market deals, like do weird stuff like yeah it's a totally relationships driven business um or if you just want like a 
solid, you know, 6%, 7% year over year return, uh, it doesn't have to be a very relationships driven business. It's super straightforward. It's very, very uh, risk, you know, low risk. So that said, I think a lot of like, I, I just see a lot of tech people and founders getting into real estate and now just seeing what I know from like experiencing it firsthand. I think they often try to get too creative and like getting super creative in real estate is often how you lose your shirt. Um, so, and you know, I, I say this completely hypocritically, uh, you know, but I don't know. I, 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 I generally think real estate works well for people without real estate experience when they take a very, uh, you know, uh, you know, very low risk approach to it. Um, uh, but you know, I'm, you know, not following my own advice. What's an example of a weird off market thing, you know, besides something, what you're doing, uh, that you've seen people do that, you know, hasn't worked or you're not sure. Oh, you get pitched all kinds of strange stuff all the time when you're in real estate. It's like, you know, especially when you're trying to do something interesting in the real estate world, it's like, oh, you know, uh, New York City has this canal, uh, the Gowanus Canal, that's like a super fun site, meaning it's like contaminated with all sorts of like heavy metals and like, you know, really, really stuff you don't want to mess with. And, you know, I you hear someone coming to you all the time being like, oh, I've got this site like right on the Gowanus Canal. Like, you know, it used to be industrial. We're converting it to residential. And like, you know, hopefully they don't find like, you know, arsenic in the uh, in the groundwater or something. So it's like, you know, you see all kinds of weird stuff. And frankly, I, I ignore most of it. And just from a, from a realist. And high quality. And rather than innovating on kind of where the place is located, uh, innovate on the community, innovate on the pro, you know, on the, on the kind of look and feel of the place, innovate on the amenities in the building, innovate on the technology that goes around it. I mean, we put a lot of technology into these homes and that's a big part of the value prop. So rather than like doing some kooky thing with where it's located, I'd just rather kind of innovate on the end user experience. So I'm in, you know, San Francisco, you're in uh, New York and, you know, also, uh, you know, San Francisco and Brooklyn and, and New York also have a lot of um, gentrification is, is a popular topic. Yeah. How do you guys think about it in the context of it? Yeah, totally. So, um, you know, we set out some simple rules at the very beginning that we, that we follow, um, you know, to really stay on the right side of it. Uh, one of those rules is we only go into vacant buildings. So we don't, um, you know, we only take vacant units. We're, we're not going in. There are a lot of real estate developers that make money by kind of kicking out existing tenants and replacing them with new tenants. We don't, we don't touch any of that. So basically it either has to be kind of a vacant dilapidated building or a new building that just came online. Um, and those are kind of the two things we look at. So, you know, making sure we're not, uh, actively contributing to displacement. Two is working with a lot of local businesses. So a lot of our efforts on the community thus far have been about building relationships with local businesses. So making sure, because I, I think one of the challenges and one of the issues with bringing a different audience into an existing neighborhood is that chains end up following and you lose a lot of the magic that makes the neighborhood special. So a lot of what we're trying to do is build those relationships with existing businesses get our members to actively engage with those businesses as opposed to like, you know, making sure the, uh, you know, you know, getting the, the big chain into the neighborhood or something like that. So, you know, there's a couple of things we're doing. Um, you know, now that kind of our first two buildings are up and running, um, we're going to spend a lot more time kind of engaging the existing community organizations in the neighborhoods, um, which we haven't had as, as much time to do over the past two months since we've, uh, we've been launching. But um, yeah, starting to get our footprint out there a little bit more. How do you think about expansion? You know, I, I was talking to Brimer about expansion for Daybreaker. That's obviously a, a different strategy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with comment, like, is there a, a playbook that you build in in one that applies to another? How, how do you think about expansion? When yeah, totally. So you know, expansion is a key part of Commons, both mission and value proposition, because I think there's an opportunity um, to create this global community of individuals all kind of living in common. And one of the value propositions that we have is that you can transition seamlessly between common buildings. 
So you can actually, with 24 hours notice, move from a empty room in one common, or move from a room in one common building to an empty room in another common building anywhere. So in another city, in another neighborhood, within the same city, and that's really powerful, and that's very different than what anyone has done in residential real estate before. And in order to deliver on that, we really have to be in a number of major cities. And I kind of look at, um, you know, you can kind of look at the General Assembly expansion playbook going into cities where you have, you know, a lot of, you know, creative individuals moving there and say, you know, those are the cities we need to be in. So SF, LA, DC, Seattle, Boston, places like that. Um, yeah, when I think we'd be uh, remiss to not include a really cool vacation spot or two in the common network. So th that's kind of how, how I'm thinking about it. But it, you know, fortunately, we, we now have, you know, 30 members living in common buildings. And, you know, you can just ask them, like, where else would they like to see common? And uh, asking your users is a wonderful thing. What pieces do you need to have in place before you expand? Uh, you mean what do we ha need to have in a new city or what do we need to have? Yeah, so I think, you know, the the most important thing is getting the, you know, real estate, you know, being able to access interesting buildings and interesting inventory. So, you know, we're already putting kind of acquisitions people down in a few cities where we want to start kind of getting a sense of the inventory on the market and exploring, you know, does it make sense for us to take a vacant building in one of those cities? So, um you know, we've got a number of people on the ground, you know, in other cities. And really, once we kind of have a timeline in a city, then adding, you know, someone to do, someone to start building community. Some, we work with a lot of wonderful partners in New York, including General Assembly, um, to help them find a home for their students and uh, other groups to help them find a home for their audiences. So I think continuing to work with, uh, with other groups like that in other cities we go into. I want to ask you some uh, some broader questions about uh, being an entrepreneur. Um, sure. But first, well, as um, when you were thinking about, you know, I know you were enamored with the, you know, the problem of common, but I also know that you're you're you know a gifted operator and and you have uh, all sorts of ideas um, to the extent that you can or have of interest. What, if anything, were ideas you were playing around with, uh, you know, <laughs> at the same time? If you weren't doing common. And you had to do another idea, uh, you know, what, what's something that comes to mind? Or oh my God! So so one idea that I, that I'm just gonna throw one out. I mean, there's, you know, yeah, they're all over the place. I actually, you know, when I was um, just for, I mean, I, I've kind of been in love with this, the, you know, the idea of of building a new new kind of real estate, a new experience around uh, rent a living for a while. Um, but at one point, you know, kind of as I was on my way uh, out of GA, I, I just said, you know, I want to explore other ideas. I'm going to create one like five slide deck every single week on a different idea. Um, so I have like 12, of, you know, 14 of those decks lying around somewhere. Um, you know, one idea that someone needs to do and like, um, I would, I would love to advise on this or whatever, if someone's doing it is to basically, uh, you know, you see all these entrepreneurs out there who are trying to find operators to you know run their businesses um and you know they're not like it's how are they finding all these operators it's like you see a lot of entrepreneurs who go on and say you know i'm creating an incubator for my ideas and going to hire teams around them and i wonder where all these operators are coming from so i think you know ga does you know kind of long since got away from the idea of training entrepreneurs and kind of training um people to be like founder CEOs as opposed to tech hires and design hires totally think there's an opportunity to uh, create a, you know, probably free school for operators, like people who don't necessarily have their own idea, but want to found a business um, and then pair them up with like, you know, chairman CEO or, you know, kind of executive chair types. Um, so I was playing around with doing something like that. Ultimately kind of felt that the real estate model was, um, the better, you know, kind of the more impactful one um, and the one that would be, you know, just a kind of bigger one to sink my teeth into. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. You also, uh, I remember uh, stuff on the post, you think education is going to be huge, uh, you know, pre, post, I mean, general summer. Oh, got a yeah. Yeah. I, I also was, was really interested in preschool. 
Um, you know, I think a lot of the innovation, you know, just coming out of General Assembly, I mean, GA has done an amazing job, you know, innovating on postgraduate education. So everything kind of after college, um, you know, effectively building a new type of graduate school. Um, education is a huge industry. It's extraordinarily complicated. The vast majority in the, of the money is kind of controlled by school districts and large institutions. So it's actually really, really difficult to build a business with the exception of kind of what, uh, you know, I like to refer to it as like the handlebars, you know, pre-K and post-grad. And you look at kind of major cities in the U.S., huge lack of pre-K, daycare, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's a real challenge. And, uh, you know, I looked at that, did kind of a deep dive into that. You know, once again, ultimately, I decided to go in a, go in a different direction. But that's another business absolutely someone should build. What do you think are the real challenges of that business? Like, why isn't it happening? You know, why isn't someone built to? Massive regulatory challenges. Really? Like, you have to have, you know, uh, a Travis Kalanick level of dedication to, you know, completely doing an end around to a crazy set of regulations if you want to do that. Because otherwise, I don't think there's a way to actually, actually make it work. But I could be wrong. Someone's got to do it. Yeah. Um, what has been your, you know, one of your most humbling experiences in, as an entrepreneur? Does, it, does experience come top of mind? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I uh, this came shortly after I uh, graduated from school. I was, uh, I'd built a small game development studio. Um, and, you know, we had built some really popular games. Um, you know, everything was, was team and rivalry based. Uh, it was called Go Cross Campus. Um, another business I built with Matt Brimer, actually. And, uh, you know, we never figured out how to make money from it, which was kind of okay in 2006 and 2007 and was very much not okay in 2008 and 2009, um, given the lack of, like, you know, we did a lot of sponsorships and uh, stuff like that. And we, you know, ad dollars were, you know, a lot easier to come by in 2006 and 2007, as were venture dollars. And uh, in 2009, we had to shut down the studio. And, uh, you know, that was an incredibly humbling and, and sad moment. And, you know, it certainly made me, makes me a lot more thoughtful about building a business today, especially aware, you know, being aware that we're in an, an environment with pretty cheap capital right now and venture dollars that are relatively easy to get, kind of knowing that that's, not always going to be the case that there will be lean times too. And, you know, a business should be built to withstand those lean times. Otherwise you have to do some really painful things like laying people off. And that's something I hope to never have to do again. Mm -hmm. Take me through the first 30 minutes. <laughs> oh, so, um, I've been running a lot lately, which has been uh, has been super fun. I've never really been an, uh, been one for a lot of like physical activity. I mean, uh, but I, I've just been getting into it, and it's been awesome. So I so I've been doing that. But kind of the most important thing that I begin my day with is I meet someone for breakfast almost every morning. Um, you know, usually eight a.m. Um, it's a great way to like get myself to roll out of bed because I know I have you know somewhere to be. Um, so I meet someone for breakfast almost every day and it's, you know, since it's at the beginning of the day, there's a lot less pressure to make it like work oriented. So it's great for like catching up with friends. It's great for, you know, maybe meeting someone who is not going to be an immediate hire, but maybe, you know, someone I can work with down the road. Um, so I try to have a breakfast meeting every morning and that's just been, uh, it's been really, really nice and super productive. Do you have any rituals or, you know, habits you swear by? either as a CEO or <laughs> personal productivity? Oh, oh man. So, uh, so all right. So this is going to kind of not be an answer to either of those. But the thing I swear by is, and I, you know, she got, got married. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I, I got married, uh, you know, end of 2014. And um, for, and, and, you know, my wife's an entrepreneur as well. Um, she runs a company called Stacklist, which helps entrepreneurs um, choose tools and services, uh, which was actually like one of the top product hunt uh, products in September, which I'm super oh, excited yeah. Yeah, for. Yeah. So, so we do we do quarterly planning as a couple, 
that is we actually sit and it's on my top of my mind because we did our q1 planning in uh in uh just this past weekend um and you know we sit down we go through a financial overview we go through kind of an operational and household overview um, we go through a social overview um and it takes like two hours but we hit all the major points um you know we come up with like what we're going to do what we're going to change how do we make our relationship better and you know it's a dedicated time for that and why that's great is it takes all of those like annoying things that you've been meaning to discuss but like haven't really found the right opportunity to do that or like don't want it you know stuff you don't want to have come up on like date night um and you kind of put it in a dedicated spot and it's been actually like a wonderful thing and i i swear by quarterly planning and uh and and personal okrs that's the other one all right uh tell me more about personal oh and so okrs are objectives and key results it's kind of a you know goal setting system um developed by google and intel a lot of companies use them um the idea is like high level qualitative objective you know and then a few key results under each objective which is like how is the objective going to be measured um, you know, we do them at common. So every single person has OKRs. Um, we do them quarterly and, uh, I do them personally as well. What are some example of, uh, personal? Oh, so, uh, one of my objectives from the last quarter was be healthier than I've ever been. And, you know, that's a great high level objective. It's kind of get, able to get me motivated and excited to do it. And then you put some, uh, you know, you put some KRs under that. So how's that going to be measured? Well, that can be measured by, you know, my weight, it could be measured by how many times I go to the gym. It could be measured by, um, you know, what's my, you know, 5K time. Um, so come up with a couple of ways that are like, well, how do I measure that? And then the idea with OKRs is you set them aggressively. And if you hit 20% of that, or sorry, if you hit 60% uh, of them, you're doing well. And take me through the quarterly planning. I'm fascinated by this concept. If a <laughs> couple comes to you and says, Brad, I want to adopt this strategy. Uh, you know, what are, what are some ways to yeah, totally. I mean, we should probably open source our template. Um, but it's pretty simple. It's just like, you know, running through all the basic things. There's like, you know, we start with a financial overview because it's the hardest. You know, we look at kind of, you know, how much did we burn last quarter? Um, you know, assuming we're burning. I mean, you know, we're, we're entrepreneurs that so we generally burn money. Um, that's kind of the way this works. Um, so how much did you burn last quarter? Uh, you know, go through all the key metrics. How much did we spend on, on what? Um, you know, what's our, you know, if, if you want to do budgeting, you can do budgeting. I, I kind of go back and forth on whether budgeting makes sense. Um, so yeah, just go through all that and uh, then talk about, you know, operations, talk about household. The idea is to kind of go through, and, and there's no, I, I wouldn't say there's one size fits all way to do this. I mean, it probably depends on, uh, it depends on the couple. It depends on what, you know, what kind of relationship people want, how close do they want to be, how much do they want to share. Um, I think it's awesome though. Yeah. When you think of the term success, who uh, first comes? Wow. Um, you know, I've always been a, you know, a big Jeff Bezos fan. Um, and I know it's, you know, he's somewhat of a controversial figure, but if you think about it in terms of just like, you know, value and kind of quality of work life at Amazon aside, you know, he laid out of a, a a grand plan, a grand vision for how to do things. And he's one of the few people I see who's really able to run a company independent, a public company independent of the whims of Wall Street. And I feel like, you know, we've, we've gotten to a place and, you know, I think you start seeing public or private companies wait to go public longer and longer and longer because it seems just like a brutally terrible existence to run a public company. Like nobody has good things to say about it. So then you look at a guy like Bezos and you say, wow, he was able to not only kind of fulfill his initial goal, but like fulfill a much larger goal and run it fairly independently of the whims of Wall Street. And I think that, you know, that level of independence is, is really, you know, values aside, really remarkable. And I think of, you know, that as being a paradigm of success for a business person. What's something you used to fervently believe, uh, whether it's about running a company or uh, just business or personal life or in intellectually, that you now see as misguided? <laughs> oh, man, I'll have to think on that one for a second. Um, you know, 
I would say just like one thing, one area I've evolved in and changed is I feel like I've become a lot calmer over like the last five years you know, going through the craziness of building General Assembly, now kind of onto it again. You know, my, uh, you know, something I tell myself probably on a more than weekly basis and tell my team almost every day is it's never as good as it seems, nor is it as bad. Mm -hmm. And just like being able to keep that in mind and just keep a little more even keeled, I think has been a, been a real way I've, you know, I've evolved. And I, I, I feel like I used to believe that uh, successful businesses were built on the back of insane work hours um, and panic. And that's, I, I no longer believe that. If there was another world in which you were talking to someone who had your same exact experience after General Assembly, imagine uh, a clone of Brad, uh, and that Brad was thinking to be a full-time venture capitalist, uh, would you tell that Brad, yeah, sure, if that's what you wanna do, go for it? Or would you tell that Brad, no, you should be running a company because running a company yeah. is, is where the opportunity is and because you could be an even more powerful investor after that? Oh my God. Uh, you know, that Brad would have to have so much more patience than this Brad has. Uh, you know, here's the problem with, you know, after being an operator for eight years, you know, I, I spent a little bit of time as a, as a venture partner, kind of an EIR at Maveron. And I, I, I feel like I was terrible at it. And terrible in what way? Well, I would always see the companies. Whenever I was pitched, I would always see the companies that I would build if I were in the entrepreneur's shoes. And I wouldn't pay attention to the business the entrepreneur is actually building. And, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I step back and I was like, wow, if I were an entrepreneur, I would hate Brad as a VC. Because I just like, I want to get in the weeds. Like, I can't help it. I do. I care about that. And not in like a helpful, I can empathize as a VC, formerly entrepreneur way. No, I want to get involved in a really annoying, dictatorial sort of way. I'm, I, I mean, obviously, that's a little bit of a, a right. you, know, you know, exaggeration. But like, you know, I, I just looked at it and said, there's no way I can do this. Like, I want to, I want to operate. You know, I love building businesses and I just couldn't, I do not have the patience to, you know, and I have a huge amount of admiration for people who have the patience to kind of bet on horses, uh, you know, bet on entrepreneurs and, you know, support them through, uh, through thick and thin and not feel the need to kind of dive in and do it themselves. But uh, I'm not one of those people. When you look at Bezos and some of the other CEOs you and operators you really admire, what's something that they do that you're you're that either you do or you're trying to do that other CEOs just don't do. I mean, there's a ton of stuff. Yeah, it's uh. So, you know, I think, I think great. You know, if you look at great executives of larger companies, have done the you know done the entrepreneurship thing successfully. Um, you know, they try to get really diverse sets of people around them, um, people who don't always necessarily share their opinions. Um, you know, who don't always agree with everything they say. Um, and I feel like that's one of the things I've really tried intentionally to do at Common is, is not to create, have a monoculture, um, but to get a really interesting set of people together um, who come from diverse perspectives and can kind of lend uh, their experience to what we do. So for instance, our, our CFO, who is one of our first employees here at Common, um, you know, he came out of retirement to join our company as CFO. He formerly ran capital markets um, in Asia at Goldman Sachs and uh, you know, was on the board of a, 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 of a bank. And that's normally not someone I would kind of run into on a regular basis. How'd you recruit him? Um, just uh, actually interestingly, um, and this is never something I would, I would advocate. Um, it just happened to work. It just happens to work in this situation. Um, I recruited both him and his son at the same time. Um, they were entrepreneurs working on a concept together themselves as kind of a CEO chairman combination. And they just decided to join common as employees, number one and two. Wow.
And I would not like I, I I feel like I had to spend so much time like un understanding the relationship and making sure it worked because it's so non traditional and so weird um, that you know it's uh, you know that's just one of those things. But uh, it works. It works beautifully. What's that like? Navigating, you know, how would you, you know, advise someone else? Who I would advise them not to. It's a terrible idea, generally. It just happens to work in this one particular situation because of their relationship, because they've worked together in the past, because they take a very professional approach to it. Um, and I kind of spent a lot of time vetting that. And, you know, it just kind of works. And... You know, I don't think that there's no checklist I would put together of like, oh, if you're thinking about hiring a father son team as employees number one and two of your startup, here's what I would do. No, don't do it. It's a terrible idea. But in this case, it just happens to work. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I would not advise anyone to do it, though. Do you advise the same thing when, when, you, when you talk to couples who want to start a company together? Is that general? I think that I, I also think that's a terrible idea. Um, you know, you're just layering risk on top of risk. I mean, it's like there's a chance. I mean, at, at least with a father-son team, it's not like they're going to break up. Right. Um, you know, they're, they're still going to be father and son. Um, so with, with couples, though, I mean, let's say there's an X percent probability your company blows up and there's a Y percent probability your relationship blows up. Um, you know, obviously, if your company blows up, you don't want your relationship to also blow up. That would be really bad. And vice versa. So, but it feels like you're kind of layering risk on top of risk there. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I mean, I, once again, I've seen people do it successfully. Um, you know, I feel like I've heard of people doing it successfully. I feel like I've heard of people, you know, hiding that type of thing from investors for a long time, which, you know, I, may or may not be the right idea. But, uh, you know, once again, like hiring a father-son team, starting something with your, your significant other, it's like these are, there are some things that like I have done that happened that just happened to either work or be working um that i would just generally not recommend as a rule right you know uh, brian told me to ask uh about your adventure <laughs> your adventure is exploring uh yale's kind of what do you say secret parts of yale's campus <laughs> oh i've been uh yeah i mean i've been a been a big fan of like exploring uh kind of old and uh, and hidden places for uh, you know for a while and getting to getting to know your your city a little bit better so that's uh, you know still something I have a, a lot of passion for do you uh, if you were 18 today knowing what you know now uh, would you would you go to Yale do you you know advise other people who are ahead of the curve to to go oh man I mean you know I was so fortunate to be able to do that I met a lot of amazing people you know I met Matt there. I started my first two companies there. You know, I've been extraordinarily fortunate as a person to be able to, you know, I grew up in the rural South, um, you know, to be able to do the things I've done that, you know, there's no way I can look back on it and say, I wouldn't have done that. Like, you know, who knows what that would have changed? Like, who knows how else my life would have turned out? Like, I have no idea. So th there's no way I can in good faith look at it and say, I would have done something different or to look someone in the eye and say like, you know, don't go to college. Um, I found it to be a wonderful experience. You know, that said, I've spent the last five, six years, uh, you know, building a company that teaches skills outside of a college context. And I am an advocate of gap years and taking a gap year. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm a personal investor in Dale Stevens, uh, you know, company on college, um, you know, based on advocating the idea of taking a gap year. Um, you know, I love what Dale is building there, kind of creating a path for students who, you know, for young people, 18 year olds, 19 year olds who may not be ready for college. Um, you know, I'm an ad I'm a big fan of college and that experience, but sometimes I think people would, you know, get more out of it if they had a little bit more context, I think I probably would have gotten more out of it if I had a little bit more uh, more context around like what's the real world like. So I do. I am an advocate for taking a year off. Rural South. I mean, it's great. Did you first get exposed to entrepreneurship in college? Or yes, I did. No, it was it was not really a thing where I'm from. And what what did your parents think of what you're doing with General Assembly? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, it's. It's funny, I, I, you know, obviously they're, they're extraordinarily proud of me and excited for me. I'm not 
totally sure they understand it sometimes, but, um, you know, and it's, it's kind of funny because they still, they, you know, I love them. They're, 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 they're responsible for who I am today in large part. Um, but it's funny because they still kind of think about it in a kind of large company, make the boss happy um, mm -hmm. context. So the question they always ask me is like, not is the company doing well? It's like, are your investors happy? <laughs> so that, that's, that's always the question is, are your investors happy? Um, so, you know, I, I love it. So, uh, and you've chosen to live in New York. Um, did you think about moving to San Francisco at, at one point? You know, I just kind of ended up through circumstance in New York while I was working on my game development studio because we had some employees who were here. Mm -hmm. Um, and I fell in love with it. I love this city. It's a wonderful place. I mean, you know, maybe I'm, it's a little hard to say that today when it's 20 degrees outside, but you know, it's, uh, I, I, I love the city. My wife and I live in, you know, here in Chelsea now. Um, I enjoy visiting San Francisco. Um, but one of the things I just love about New York is, you know, you go to a party, you go to an event, you're going to meet, you know, an artist, you're going to meet someone in finance, you're going to meet uh, a, you know, consultant, you're going to meet someone who's on Broadway, you're going to meet all kinds of people. In San Francisco, I go to a party, maybe I'm just going to the wrong parties, and everyone I meet is in tech. And I think there's a, you know, there are obviously some benefits to that, but just from a pure lifestyle perspective, um, I, I like it here. And, you know, generally, I think if you're starting off, starting a company, San Francisco is the best possible place you can be. It's the center of the universe for that. Um, but I just made a lifestyle choice to live in New York. Yeah, no, uh, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, that's why I'm in New York all the time. <laughs> yeah. um, so well, I think we'll close with, with this. If you can go back to, uh, you know, Brad at just graduating Yale um, and just about to start your post-college adventures, what's some advice you would give to your 20 Oh, can you hear me now? Sure, I know. We'll, we'll edit uh, in the podcast edition. So uh, we'll close with this. Going back, uh, if you can go back to, you know, Brad at 22, 23, just graduating Yale, what would you tell your 22, 23-year-old? That's a beautiful place to uh, to close. Uh, so, Brad, thank you uh, so much for taking the time. This fantastic chat. Where, can, yeah, where can our audience uh, learn more about you? This is the time where you plug Common. You know, a ton of entrepreneurs in the audience. Work, you know, they, either they want to live at Common or they want to work for Common. You know, uh, tell more about Common and what we can expect. Excellent. Check out Common. And uh, thanks again, Brad. We will, we will hang soon. Definitely a pleasure. Make it easy. Okay. This has been another episode of Product Hunt Live. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. If you have any feedback, uh, please tweet us at, uh, product, you know, at Product Hunt, at Product Hunt Live, or me at 
at Eric Tornberg, E-R-I-K-T-O-R-E-N-B-E-R-G. Please give feedback about future guests that you would like to see uh, and questions you, you have for them and uh, just any feedback in general. Uh, big shout out to the Blab team uh, for making this happen as well as the product tent uh, engineers, Andreas, Mike, Lucas, uh, and the, the rest of them. And um, Emily, who helps on the, on the live team. And then everybody, yeah, this has been fantastic. And we will have uh, a lot more coming. Everybody, have an awesome day. Okay. Thanks, Brad. <laughs>